Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this webinar. My name is Frank Schneider, and I'm the head of communications at Interact Central Europe. It is my pleasure to be your host today as we officially launch our third call for project proposals. Today is an exciting day for all of us. We have just published the full application package on our website this morning. With all the crucial details you will need to know to develop and submit your project ideas. In today's session, my colleagues will walk you through these requirements and the steps to take if you want to apply with us. However, before we dive into the specifics, we'd like to know a bit more about who's joining us today. And for this, we've set up two quick polls on Slido. If you see Slido on the right side of your screen in the applicant community, you're ready to go. If not, just visit slido.com in a web browser and enter the hashtag Interact CE call to participate. Please keep in mind that Slido is the key tool for our Q&A session later on, so you will want to make sure you are connected. Right after the polls, we'll start collecting your questions. So this is your chance to ask about any part about of the application process that's unclear to you. However, let's now launch the first poll and see who is uh, with us today. So the first poll is launching. The first question is, did you join our webinar in July in which we previewed this call? The answers are dropping in. We have 51 votes. In total, we have more than 300 people connected with us this morning. So let's wait until we have at least 100 votes in this Slido poll and then see. So currently I see 30% were with us, <clears throat> sorry, in July already. <clears throat> and 70% are with us uh, for the first time today to hear about the third call. Please keep on voting. We are standing at around 70 votes right now. I see the picture is not changing much. Is not the final result, but maybe we can uh, show the result and move on. So we have less, slightly less, or let's say around a third of you have been with us in July and already heard about the thematic and territory focus of the call. You heard already a little bit about what small scale projects are in this call, how we define them in this third call. Um, you heard already uh, what we are looking for. However, Two thirds of you are with us for the first time today and everything is new. So this is good to know. Um, we will kind of um, touch on what we said in July, of course. We will not start on an elevated level, but we will repeat the basics, of course. But we will also already dive a lot deeper, as I said, in the slides. So if only 30% were with us, I'm curious about the second question we have for you. Because the second question is, do you, uh, do you plan to apply with us in this call? And if so, in which stage are you with your preparations? Now, there, here I'm really curious because uh, if there was only 30% in the July webinar, I guess that many of you are in early stages, but maybe I'm mistaken. Let's see. So we have more than 70 votes already. Let's have a look at the results so far. Okay. As I said, 300 something participants we have. And if I uh, project these numbers, I think we will have quite a few applications because 70% of you are saying, yes, we will definitely apply. We are quite advanced already. We have a nearly complete partnership and already very concrete plans for what to do in these 
small scale projects for peripheral and lagging areas. Um, a third of you says, yes, we might apply. So I think it depends a lot on what you hear today in the webinar. Um, what are the rules? What are the requirements? So hopefully you will be uh, motivated and encouraged to submit an application. And exactly half I see uh, now that I uh, take a look here at the answers. Half of you are not sure yet uh, whether you will submit an application in the court. So again, here, I hope we can motivate you and encourage you to apply with us in the coming weeks uh, until mid-December when we close the call. So thank you for sharing your inputs. And now let's get started with a welcome address from Martin Hutter, representing the City of Vienna, our Program Managing Authority. Hello, Martin. Thank you for being here today to kick off the launch of this very special call. The floor is yours, Martin. Hello, good morning. Uh, it's a pleasure for me today opening uh, this webinar and launching the third call of Interact Central Europe. It's really a pleasure for me speaking to you. It's, I'm very happy that so many of you joined today's uh, webinar and I'm very optimistic that uh, many project ideas will come out uh, today and in the next weeks. As you might know, uh, Central Europe is uh, a program area with uh, many different uh, geographical issues. We have uh, functional urban areas. We see peripheral inner and outer peripheral regions in our program area. We have coastline, we have mountainous regions. So uh, how to tackle with these different challenges of municipalities, of citizens, of enterprises and of regions. We do this by offer our applicants, our beneficiaries, our citizens, our enterprises, uh, several specific objectives in different in different areas, just to tackle uh, the challenges. We force the operation to get uh, to get together, and uh, for this call, we have created some very specific issue. Uh, the aim of today's of the call three of Interact Central Europe is uh, to our intention is to unlock the development of uh, potentials of peripheral and uh, lagging areas. Uh, for that, we have also uh, especially designed this call three. We'd like to kindly ask you, we'd like to invite you to develop your project ideas, to put your project ideas into very concrete projects, and of course, to submit these project applications. And for that, uh, from side of our program, we have a wide range of support measures, which we'd like to present you. And I would like to kindly invite you to take part in call three, to uh, develop good project ideas, to submit them. And um, yes, I'm happy that so many of you joined today. And uh, from our side, um, I would like to kindly invite you to follow our webinar, to ask questions if you have them, and yes, to submit good project ideas. And from my end, uh, I would like to kindly thank you for your participation in today's webinar, in the program as such. And I would like to wish you good luck for your project. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Martin. Um, you already touched uh, on the objective of the call. You already um, said also something about the, the, the design of the call. And next we will hear from uh, Luca Ferrarese, the head of our Joint Secretariat. Hi, Luca. Welcome. Um, I understand you are going to dig a little bit deeper on what Martin already said. Like, what is the context? Why are we doing this call the way we are doing it before we really get into the call and say something more about the objective, the focus, etc., and all the other details? So, Luca, um, the floor is yours. Hi, good morning. Thank you, Frank, for uh, the floor. And of course, uh, yeah, I will give you a little bit of information on the context, but of course, the, the main part will then be presented by my colleagues later on. Anyway, I think it is needed to, uh, in order to understand also the details of a call, to have at least a, a grip and understanding of where we come from, why we are doing this. Maybe also considering that a good 70% of the people following today was not here in the, in the preview event we did in June, 
Maybe to start with some basics, just to remind us that Central Europe is an area in which we have regions, 80 regions from nine countries, as you see in these maps. This area is characterized by, by many flows, many linkages, which are putting together these regions. These flows, these connections are happening by themselves. They are happening through business, through environment uh, uh, structures, to, to services, to governance, which are uh, connecting our regions. So it, that's why we call it as a functional area, which has common territorial, economic, social, and cultural features. Um, our Central Europe program funding, as you can, you can see in the next slide, is going along these flows, along these connections. We are supporting partnerships in order to do better what they are doing anyway. And that's why uh, we always say that our projects should improve what you have already in mind to do, what you want to do with the other regions in this area, in your daily business. Uh, our projects are uh, bringing together public, private, civil society organizations they are working on new results, new solutions to address better the problems that do not stop at the borders. And I think we did already quite a lot so far. As you will see in the next slide, uh, we funded already in the 21-27 period 100 projects. These 100 projects were funded in 2022 with the first call and in 2023 with the second call. And they are uh, already uh, putting in network more than 1,000 uh, entities, more than 1,000 beneficiaries, which are working currently together. I have to say, I'm very proud to see what these projects are already doing. There are already concrete results, concrete solutions for the good of our regions and for the good of our citizens. So a lot has been already done and 80% of the funds are already allocated. Now it's time to focus more on where maybe with the 20% of remaining funds, we have to, to focus on those issues that deserve a special attention. Uh, as you can see uh, also in this slide, um, among others, one of the issues that we are we intend to address as a cooperation program is to address the issue of uh, areas which we say are lagging behind. Those areas which are, uh, uh, let's say, uh, facing lower competitiveness, are facing shrinking population, are falling into the risk of falling into a development trap. These areas are rather common in Central Europe. As you can know, as you know, as you can see also from this map, there are areas which are really poles of development in which there is a high level education, high level development, uh, a lot of business happening. And there are at the same time areas which are struggling in, uh, in their uh, development. And they are struggling into even keeping the people there living. So this is where we want exactly to address with our call to focus on these uh, uh, lagging behind areas, on these peripheral areas, and this is where the call wants to go. And this will be then presented next by my colleagues. So Frank, I give you the floor back to you and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Luca. Um, I, I really like how you present these things with the maps. Uh, I, especially the second map, I, I, I really like, which shows the core of cooperation within Central Europe. And then you follow up with the last map when you see like, oh, yeah, there's still peripheral and lagging areas, even where we have so much cooperation going on already. Um, and this already takes me uh, straight away to the next uh, speaker and to the objective of the call, which will be introduced uh, to you by my colleague Monika schönerkle grasse the head of the project unit for uh, strategy. And Monica, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, um, Frank, and also a very good morning from my side. I'm very happy and proud to present you this objective of the call, which is a very targeted one. And um, as Luca was already explaining, we have a lot of regions which are 
rather disadvantaged of facing disparities and problems related to demographic change. And this was exactly the reason why our, mo our monitoring committee decided to devote this third call, which is a rather small call, as also was already said, specifically to these lagging and peripheral areas. And therefore, the overall aim of the call is to pioneer solutions for making those peripheral and lagging areas more attractive to live and work in. So you see already here that the focus is both on the um, on this type of territories, but also on the population, on the communities working in um, living and working in these areas. Um, the next slide summarizes in a very nutshell, what are the specificities of the call? As I said before, this call is a very special one. It's a very focused one, and it has both a territorial and a thematic focus. It um, focuses actually on four out of the nine specific objectives, which are only open in this call. Um, there are also some other novelties in this um, third call. As a first time, we are actually having a new project type, which are small scale projects, which are shorter, which are smaller, which have less money compared to our classic projects. But this standard, this, this project features, they will be explained to you in more detail afterwards. And as another novel element, as part of the quality assessment, we will also invite shortlisted projects of good quality to um, present in an online meeting, in an online hearing, also their project proposals. Overall, as said before, the budget of this call is limited since um, the majority of funds have already been allocated in the previous two calls, as was said al al always already by Luca. And we will have the usual co-financing rate of 80%, as also in the previous calls. Um, and in this respect, I would also like to refer you to um, the more detailed call requirements, which you can all read in the TOR of the call, which is part of the application package. Um, we have also um, an indicative budget for each of the four program-specific op um, objectives, which are open in this call. Um, as you see here on this slide, the highest budget is foreseen for the program specific objective dealing with smart skills development, notably the SO 1.2, which is followed um, in terms of budget allocation by SO 4.1 dealing with governance and the two more transport related SOs, namely 2.5 and 3.1. All the contents um, are described, of these SOs are described in the, in the IP, in the program document. And I will also give some more explanations on these SOs um, in, in a minute. As for the timeline of the call, um, actually we had already the preview before summer, which was also mentioned already in the beginning of this webinar. And today we are very happy to launch the call formally. So this means all the application documents, um, the application package uh, is um, available already on the website. So you can download all the materials and um, also the in GEMS, the call will be open. So this means you can already start preparing your application form. And this call will be open for a bit less than two months and we will close on 10th of December. So still in the middle of December before, um, before Christmas time. And as regards um, the timeline for the selection, of course, this will depend on the, on the number of projects which we will receive. But we estimate that the selection will take place in summer 25, so next year. And before in the first half of 25 in springtime, we expect that we will um, do the hearings um, with the shortlisted projects as said before. Coming now back to the territorial focus of the call, um, 
which is one of the main features of the program uh, of this call, we have um, set some requirements for those lagging and peripheral areas which have to be addressed by projects in this call. On the next slide, you see um, that um, there are three main requirements which um, areas to be addressed in um, third call projects they have to comply with. So at least, um, so projects have, so these areas which are subject of the third call projects, they have to be char characterized by at least one out of these three requirements. Namely these areas, they have to face either a, a low economic potential or and or poor access to services of general interest and being often affected also by demographic change or they have to face a lack of relational proximity decline in significance influence or connectivity and this is something so this compliance with at least one out of the, these three characteristics is essential so we don't have any list of regions or maps um, which are eligible but you have to describe very clearly in a qualitative way why and how these, each of these areas addressed in the project um, are in line with at least one of these three um, bullet points. And as for the scale or the size of um, peripheral or lagging areas, they can actually be, be very different. They can actually very um, can be very small, ranging from, for instance, some districts or local neighborhoods. They can cover a whole village or even a whole small or medium-sized town or an entire region. So what really counts is that they have to comply with at least one of these criteria mentioned. Um, on the slide. If we come to the thematic focus, as said before, this call focuses only on four SOs, um, which have been chosen in a way because they are, are of particular relevance for the peripheral and lagging areas. And within these SOs, projects can address the entire thematic scope as described in our Interreg cooperation program. Um, these SOs are notably SO 1.2, strengthening development of smart skills, SO 2.5, greening urban mobility, SO 3.1, um, improving transport connections of rural and peripheral regions, and SO 4.1, strengthening governance for integrated development. Um, what I would also like to mention that um, inside these um, S4 SOs, there are certain topics which um, are covered less by projects which are approved already under the previous course so far. And on the next slides, um, we put for your inspiration some thematic topics we would also recommend you to consider when you develop your project ideas. However, it's, it will not give you any extra points or influence the assessment of proposals if you're addressing those topics. So you can, as said before, you can also um, focus on each, on the whole scope of, of, of thematic fields as in the IP. But just to mention those um, where we see that this could be taken up as an inspiration for you in SO 1.2, which aims at place-based actions for development as, um, of skills. There could be some interesting topics um, um, which are especially relevant for um, peripheral and lagging areas in relation to brain drain, out-migration, loss of skilled workforce. 
um, social entrepreneurship, digital transition, all under the umbrella of capital and skills development. Um, if we move to SO 2.5 on greening urban mobility, maybe there I would particularly highlight that um, SO 2.5, one of the specificity is that um, projects, they have to foresee a functional urban area approach. This means projects should address mobility challenges, um, considering especially the linking of um, small and medium-sized towns and um, hinterlands in order to um, um, consider um, this functional perspective of functional urban areas. And some topics which are not covered so far and which we would also recommend maybe to consider are sustainable multimodal connections in towns and their hinterlands to um, improve mobility in peri-urban areas, including villages, and also the accessibility of public transport for everyone. So applying somehow an integrated and integrative approach also addressing maybe elderly and disabled people or other disadvantaged population groups. As for SO3.1, um, also being linked to transport, this um, SO aims at improving transport connections of rural and peripheral regions as such. And um, there, some recommended topics are linked to sustain sustainable passenger transport, but also to improving and testing regional mobility services in the public interest for citizens. So also here you see that there should be actually a focus on um, addressing citizens and, and the communities living in these um, peripheral and um, lagging areas. If we move then to the last um, specific objective, which is open in this call, which is 4.1, this um, SO deals with strengthening governance for integrated territorial development. Um, this SO actually allows to address very complex challenges such as demographic change and public service provision in a very integrated way and in a also um, considering um, um, cross-sectoral approaches. So this means this SO is not a thematically driven one, but the one which is uh, which emphasizes governance as such, um, which can be applicable to, to various thematic fields or sectors. And with the, this thematic and territorial focus, I hand over then back to Frank and my other colleagues to give more information on the specific project features. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much, Monica. Um, very, um, very informative uh, presentation of yours. Um, I can only say you already answered quite a few questions that were dropping in while you were speaking or before you were speaking. Um, I uh, have, for example, a very much upvoted question by uh, Lisa Petitjean. Uh, is there any definition of the peripheral uh, lagging area? I think you, you touched on that. So, Lisa, um, I don't know if your question was answered. Um, maybe you want to uh, resubmit a more specific question um, uh, building on, on what you have there. The same with the uh, uh, question by Sabine. Um, who was asking for a map of lagging areas. I think you also already said that we don't have such map, uh, that it's a qualitative approach uh, to uh, peripheral and lagging. And there's more questions coming in. So I would like to really remind you to uh, pose your questions there, uh, put your questions there. Next, we will touch on small projects and their features. We will then talk about the budget. So if you already have questions in that regard, um, then uh, feel free to put them already there now. Um, one question is there about whether the slides will be made available. Yes, um, you will receive an email uh, tomorrow, including a recording of this webinar, so you can re-watch uh, the parts that interest you most. Uh, you can go through the slides, um, and um, for that service, all that we are asking for is some feedback. 
so that we can further improve maybe um, and see whether this was a helpful webinar or not. So there will be this email coming towards you tomorrow and uh, then you will have all the information available. Um, so uh, having said this, um, let's continue with uh, Christoph Ebermann, who is the head of the project unit uh, responsible for operational issues. Uh, good morning, Christoph. Good morning, Frank, and good morning, everyone. Um, it's my pleasure to be here and to present to you uh, further details on the specificities of the small, small scale projects. If we go directly into the contents, uh, small scale projects as such, as we already heard, should be shorter and um, with a lower budget than our classic projects. Um, in our call three, the small scale projects need to have a clear emphasis on territorial challenges of peripheral and lagging areas. The recommended duration is of uh, 12 to 24 months and there is a budget ceiling. So uh, the total max budget is of 800,000 euros. If we look now into the partnership, we have uh, the normal rules that we have also in our classic projects that apply. In terms of minimum requirements, we have to have at least three financing partners coming from at least three countries, out of which at least two need to be in Central Europe. However, we don't have a recommended size in terms of uh, partnership, because uh, this in the end depends on the project scope and, of course, uh, the budget limitations need to be considered when you compose your partnership. Looking into the composition of the partnership, all types of institutions uh, can apply. Um, they, are, they, of course, in your partnership, you should have the partners which are coherent with the territorial and thematic scope of your project. So you should have in your partnership partners who have the right competences for implementing the activities, for example, on the ground and the areas targeted. Uh, you should address the correct uh, governance levels. Uh, involve the different sectors you need for your projects and uh, also it can open up already the outreach to target group. Um, since our call, as I was uh, already mentioning and also my colleagues have mentioned, we have a very strong territorial focus. Uh, the um, participation of local and regional actors is encouraged, uh, for example, having the public authorities or related institutions involved, civil society, uh, organization, uh, association, NGOs, etc. When it comes to the participation of research institutions, uh, their participation should be rather limited in, in the projects. They should mainly act as uh, knowledge providers and support the local and regional actors with their expertise feeding into the project implementation. Looking now into the intervention logic. We already heard um, the project has a thematic and territorial focus, and therefore your project objective needs to be clearly aligned with this thematic and territorial focus. Uh, the thematic focus is what uh, you just heard a moment ago from my colleague Monica. Uh, it's the four SOs which are open. You need to select one and you need to target what is foreseen in these SOs in the program document, in the program IP. And there is the territorial focus. Uh, so uh, considering these characteristics, which were also presented a moment ago. In your project, you will have the possibility to define two project specific objectives. The reason why there are only two project specific objectives is because the application form as such is built that you can only define one project specific objective per work package. And in this call, there is a limitation to a maximum of two work packages. In terms of outputs, the full set of output types, uh, which we usually have in our program is available. So you get, like, strategies can be developed, action plans, pilot action solutions and corporations. In this regard, um, I would uh, also advise you to have a close look at the information in this regard in our program manual, as well as in the Annex 2 of the program manual where um, there are the specifications included for the indicators. What is very important in this call is that it is mandatory that each project needs to have at least one joint pilot action, uh, which should be implemented at local or regional level. 
and a related solution deriving from this pilot action. So this is a must for projects in this call. The focus of projects uh, in their pilot actions is rather on soft measures. So we are not having an investment focus in this in this call. There are no investments above 25,000 euros uh, allowed. There are no items under cost category six infrastructure and works allowed. So um, this is also due to the fact that uh, as we already heard, budgets and duration of projects should be limited. And this should be, of course, feasible in the duration of a small scale project. In your pilot action and in your overall project, you should uh, strive at involving local and regional stakeholders um, and having a bottom up participatory approaches in order to engage with the local communities. Because what we want to achieve uh, through this call is to have a real change taking place at local and regional level. Therefore, in terms of project results, we're looking for tangible and place-based uh, approaches and results, which have a clear local or regional dimension, which involves local communities and the related target groups of the project, leading in the end to increased capacities of these uh, target groups for the challenge of peripheral and lagging areas addressed by your project. Continuing with the work plan, as I already mentioned, there will be a maximum of two uh, thematic work packages uh, allowed and foreseen uh, in the application form. For those who have not been with us in, a, in the previous uh, project um, of our 2127 program, there is no separate work package for management and communication. So we're all, when we talk about two work packages, we only talk about content uh, work packages so activity driven communication is an integral part uh, of these thematic work packages. Uh, inside these work packages, um, there should be, you have a series of activities you need to define and uh, there should be not more than four to six uh, activities per work package. And each activity needs to include at least one deliverable, which is then the documentation of the outcome of the activities conducted. And since we have a call with a limited duration, and we are looking for smaller projects, we are recommending to have not more than two deliverables uh, per activity. Um, for further guidance on the intervention logic, please have a look uh, at the program manual. There is a, a lot of information included there, and especially at the offline uh, application form template, which is part um, of uh, the call uh, application package. And of course, please have also look, a look at our online tutorials where further information and uh, specifications are provided. If we look now at the timeline of an exemplary project, um, what I'm presenting here to you is really just an example. There is no, no obligation to follow such a structure, but uh, when considering a duration, for example, of 18 months or 24, depending uh, of uh, um, which activities you're foreseeing. Uh, a first uh, block could be, for example, for the first period, months one to six, uh, setting up this framework, um, uh, building capacity in, in the partnership or building a strategic framework and the conceptualization and preparation of the pilot actions. The pilot actions could take place in the second period or could take place uh, in period two or three, depending on uh, how long uh, your overall duration is. Usually when I'm talking in terms of periods, you would see it in when you are doing your application form in GEMS, it's a six monthly period. So uh, this really depends on the scope of what you, what you want to do. So it can also be three months, six months, nine months. It's depending really on the type of activities you're foreseeing, but really the pilot action implementation should be really the core of your project. And what is very important is that this pilot action implementation, you cannot stop it at the end of your project. It needs to be somewhere in the middle because as a last phase of your project, um, there needs to be a solution deriving from the finished pilot action. So this is the moment where you draw your lessons learned, where you have a re joint review on, of the outcomes. So this allows you to prepare the solution and to consider how this solution and how your other project outcomes uh, and outputs and results can be uh, taken up at institutional or at political level. 
this uh, this allows me now to come already to the key features of what is a good proposal. Um, and uh, we already heard a bit about it. Um, first and a very important element is, of course, that the project needs to have a very clear and relevant intervention logic. This means that the chain from the challenges you want to address to your objectives, the activities, the outputs, and then the results at territory level you want to achieve, they need to be well aligned, they need to be coherent, and it needs to be very, very clear what you want to do within your project. Thereby, since we are a transnational cooperation program, it is, of course, key that your project must have a very clear added value uh, from transnational cooperation. So it needs to become clear why in the topic uh, you are working, it is essential that you are working on it at transnational level. What is the added value that this brings and why this could not be solved, uh, for example, by a merely local or regional project where you would not cooperate with partners at transnational level. Thereby, your project and your should be innovative in the sense that um, it should go beyond the state of play in the sector you're addressing or of the state of play of what is being implemented in the regions you are working on. So there needs to be innovative elements included and thereby, um, Please also consider available knowledge. There is not the need always to reinvent the wheel. There is a lot of knowledge out there which can be valorized and integrated into your project. For all this, you need a sound work plan. Um, don't make your work plan too complicated. It should be, especially for projects of such a short duration, uh, it should be very well focused and clear. Uh, the more clear your work plan is, the more convincing your proposal will be. If we continue with further uh, key features, of course, you need to have the right partners on board. Your partnership needs to be relevant. They need to, the partners you have, they need to have the competences to implement what you are foreseeing. Um, as I was mentioning earlier, uh, pilot actions are a must at local or regional level, depending on the uh, scope or territorial scope of your project. So you need to have the partners on board who have the competences to implement these activities in these lagging and uh, peripheral areas. Um, of course, uh, there needs also to be the ex respective expertise included in the partnership. So as such, your partnership composition should be really competent and convincing. Management, of course, in every project management is important. Uh, you need to coordinate uh, your partners. You need to coordinate the inputs the partners are delivering in order to have really the essence and the added value of uh, cooperation. You need to foresee uh, mechanisms for quality control, for feedback loops. Um, and so overall, effective project management will allow you to ensure quality outputs and quality of results. Communication thereby is key. Uh, I was mentioning already that communication is not a separate work package. Communication is to be integrated fully into your thinking and into your work plan, since communication will support you to achieve your project objectives and to transfer also your results uh, beyond your project partners and target groups also to other regions. And it will also help you uh, for the sustainability of your outputs. Projects should have a clear value for money and an efficient budget. Uh, this is a point you will hear shortly more about it from my colleague Helga. And then as a last point, projects should have a long lasting impact. In order to achieve this, you need already to think about um, the uptake of your results and the, uh, the, the uptake of your results and the creation of long lasting benefits when you are shaping your project. So this is not something you can um, start thinking of only at the end of the projects. Uh, start thinking of it straight from the beginning because you need to involve the right target groups. You need to work with them. You need to um, include them in the decision-making processes so that at the end, the products are well known and taken up. And this will then create long-lasting uh, effects uh, in the territories and really and making the change, and this is what this closes the loop to what I was saying at the beginning, this will make the change in the territories targeted by your projects, which are affected by challenges related to peripherality or because they are lagging behind.
And with this, I hand back to my colleague Frank again. Thank you, Christoph. Uh, I promise there will be questions for you. <laughs> Thank you for presenting this. There's already uh, one question really upvoted on pilot actions. Um, we will come to this very soon. First, uh, we would like to touch on uh, budget. And also, since budget, um, in the past, we had many slides on budget. Uh, now it's Helga Portelli, my colleague um, uh, from the program unit, head of the program uh, unit. Um, Helga only has one slide on budget, and then she will also introduce you to the uh, support measures we offer as a program. Helga, I cannot see you yet. I'm Are you coming afraid, into the I'm, room? I'm afraid I'm not allowed to uh, switch on my video suddenly. Oh. Days you cannot start your video because the host has stopped it. So I ah, hear you come. Um, now we let you in. Ega, welcome. The floor is yours. Thank you, Frank. And even though we are uh, slightly behind schedule, I hope you have the patience with me to hear also about the budget. I will focus on the specificities of the budget within this uh, third call. We have already heard also from my colleague Christoph saying that the project has cannot be more, the total budget cannot be more than 800,000 uh, euros, which is equivalent to a maximum of 640,000 of ERDF. When we speak about the maximum, it's really the maximum of it does not mean that every project every proposal has to be 800,000 we have also uh, heard um, in the last slide before this one um, Christoph mentioning value for money we will assess the value for money and therefore your budget should always reflect the activities that are going to be carried out in your proposal now, coming to uh, the options from which uh, partners can choose for their budget, we have two options. And we have option here, you might say, why is it option two and option three and not one and two, if there are two options. But this is to keep uh, in line with what is in our program manual, because for the other calls, uh, the first and second call, we had three options. But here, that's why I want to specify what are the options which, uh, from which uh, the partners can choose for the budget for this call. Uh, starting from the first option, I mean, when we look at the project from the different phases, for the preparation costs, it is a lump sum for preparation costs. Uh, and this is for both options. Uh, the lump sum uh, is, will be paid to those projects that will ultimately be approved and to those who would have foreseen such lump sum in the um, application form. This 17,500 uh, of uh, lump sum is forms part of the total budget. So you have to take it into consideration when preparing your budget that you do not go beyond the 800,000, as I mentioned earlier. Um, so the first option would be uh, the simplified cost option that applies for staff costs, which is 20%. But I will start from the more from the bottom up. Uh, so this, the project uh, partner would foresee what costs there are he has under external expertise, so cost category four and cost category five, which is equipment, and based on those costs, a flat rate of 20% is applied for the staff costs. And then, so this is a choice. But then if this uh, option is chosen, then there is an automatic and mandatory simplified cost option for office and administration costs, which is 15% of the calculated staff costs. And... Uh, also, another flat rate for cost category three, which is travel and accommodation costs. And here, the flat rate depends on the country of the partner. So there is a flat rate percentage, and this you can also find in our uh, program manual. This is the first option. And the other option is um, that the staff costs are calculated on a real cost basis. So you calculate how much your staff costs are for the 
project activities that you will be carrying out. And then an automatic 40% of that of the staff costs is calculated for all other costs. So this would include all cost categories from cost category two, administration costs, uh, travel costs, ex external expertise and equipment costs. Uh, you can already see here that we do not include uh, the cost category six, which is infrastructure and works, because as my colleague has mentioned, this cost category is not eligible for the third call. And um, what I would like to point out is that this is the, the selection between the options is at partner level. So it is not at project level. It does not have to be that all the partners have to go for the same option. Each partner has to decide based on uh, its needs, which is the best option, whether it's option two or option three. So as you can see here, it's either going for staff costs on a flat rate or staff costs uh, on a real cost basis. And then for the closure uh, phase, it is the option that you would have chosen, either option two or option three, that will also be applied for uh, the closure phase. Something that I uh, have not mentioned is that if your project would be, if the budget is above the 800,000 uh, limit, when you would go to submit the project, the system will not allow you to do this because it is an eligibility issue. So this is, in a nutshell, the specificity, specificities of the project budget. And now I would like to also present to you uh, the uh, support measures and tools that we have at uh, program level. So we have various support measures. And given that you are now following this webinar, you do know that we have an applicant community because you are following this webinar through the community, which hopefully also helps and facilitates uh, the partner search. Through this um, community, we also hold the consultations, you can also have meetings in this community. Um, it's, it's a tool that we, we provide to our applicants and to our beneficiaries. We also have webinars, as you can see, we are here today, and we also had a preview webinar uh, some time ago. And um, we will also have a Q&A webinar coming up very soon, but we will hear about this uh, shortly. Uh, my colleague Christoph also made uh, already reference to videos and tutorials that we have prepared and explainers which introduce uh, key aspects of the call and also thematic fields and project development. Um, apart from what we offer at program level at, at, at the JS level, there are all there's a lot of support also at national level which is given by our national contact points where, and we really recommend that you get in touch with your, with your contact points. You can also discuss your application and any issues that you have with them also in your own national, uh, in your own language. And before coming to the consultations, I just want to point out that we also have a help desk available for you to send us any emails with any general questions that you might have. Um, as another measure of support is the, in, in, the individual consultations, which uh, we always provided these individual consultations where we provide guidance on the project development and the application requirements. But in uh, the third call, the consultation is actually mandatory. So, um, Coming to the um, specificities of the consultations, the compulsory consultations, we really recommend that you have the consultation at an early stage uh, of your project development. And um, um, the consultation is held, uh, the basis of the consultation is the project idea form that you need to submit through our applicant community. It does not mean that you need to publish it and make it uh, available for all to see, but you need to submit it to the JS for the consultation uh, to be based on, um, on it. 
we do not consult uh, full application forms, but really we want to consult the project idea with you. Uh, it is uh, important that you request this consultation between the 17th of October and the 3rd December. And after uh, this consultation, uh, you will receive um, a confirmation from the JS with a specific reference number uh, that then the lead partner would have to insert uh, in the lead partner declaration, which is one of the annexes of the application form. So uh, we will not be sending the confirmation exactly after, so it's not like five minutes after the, the consultation, but we will send them in tranches. But if it's almost time to submit your application form and you did not receive such confirmation, please, uh, we ask you to get, that you will get back to us. That's in a nutshell on the consultations. And I already mentioned earlier our national contact points who also uh, at national level um, organize uh, online Q&A sessions and meetings. And here you can see uh, the, um, the calendar uh, of eight out of our nine um, member states. And we... Um, we recommend that you go to our website, go to the event calendar where you can really see which uh, events are coming up in your own country so that you can also um, register to these events. So the call uh, documents, uh, my colleagues have already mentioned that you can already download our call documents. The application package is available on our website. This comprises of the terms of reference. Uh, we, uh, we have an application form, which is an offline template of the application form, which gives guidance on each and every textbook, what we expect, how to fill in, and so on and so forth. Uh, there are the declarations, the templates, uh, lead partner and project partner declarations. There is a simplified financial statement for uh, private lead applicants, and also the template of pitch deck for online hearings. That is the application package, which is very important for you. And we also provide tools where right there in, in the toolbox, you can find a, a self-assessment tool for your uh, project proposal. There's a um, summary generator, and also uh, there is a... Um, a calculator which for, for private lead applicants which show whether you really have the financial capacity to be uh, the lead partner. And then we have manuals, we have the program manual and the GEMS manual, which are not only available in PDF version, but we also have them in HTML, where it's very easy for you to navigate in these, in these manuals. And uh, what I want to really point out is since the call three is rather specific and we have some certain requirements, which we have gone through in this presentation, it's important that you look at both the TOR and the program manual concurrently so that you see where the difference are. So that if you see something in the manual, like for example, there is another option for the budget, you know that for the third call, this is not applicable. Um, yeah, that's it in a nutshell um, for the uh, package. And coming to the to GEMS, you know that the application forms need to be um, submitted to us through our web-based monitoring system, which is GEMS. You here have uh, the link to, to GEMS. And uh, to help you, we also have some pre-submission checks which um, show uh, it's like a traffic light system. You have, if it is red, it means that something you have failed in something in, in a requirement and you need to change it. Otherwise, the system will not allow you to submit it. And this is, for example, I mentioned the 800,000. If you put 801,000, the, the system will not allow you to submit the project and you will have a red warning. Um, then there are orange warnings, which means that uh, you can submit the project, but it's there are some things where 
it is desirable that you uh, change something. So there are recommendations and uh, there is the green system. The green, it means that all is fine and um, you can submit. We really recommend that you uh, run these uh, pre-submission checks regularly and do not leave it until the very last minute in order not to be disappointed that for the, in the last minute you cannot find where the errors are and uh, the system will not allow you to submit your project. So uh, this is it from my end and I hand back to Frank. Thank you very much, Helga. Um, with this, we are coming to an end of the presentations and Next, we have exactly 30 minutes left for 29 questions. So this is a good challenge for us. A little bit like speed dating uh, on this. Um, I think we will start maybe uh, with the more uh, general questions. So I would like to ask uh, Monika Schöner-Klee-Grasser back into the room. Um, and we can touch on questions related to... Hello, Monika. Welcome back. We can touch on a few questions uh, related to the territorial focus, to the thematic focus. We have, I saw a question on how many uh, proposals can I uh, hand in. So let's start without any further ado and dive into the questions. Um, to the audience, if you have any more questions, feel free to write uh, them down, send them in. We will try to take them in this webinar still. If needed, we can also extend a few minutes maybe. But um, yeah, let's now start straight away with the uh, first question. And actually, this is not going to be the one by Roman Hillebrand because this is more of a technical nature already, I'd like to say. But we will start with a question by Francesco Bucci, who was um, upvoted by eight other participants. And the question, Monica, for you is, are middle and large city suburbs, uh, uh, peripheral neighborhoods, considered a target area within this call, apart from topic two? Yeah, thank you very much for this question. So. Yeah, as I said also in my presentation, um, it's it's um, this um, the peripherality and and lagging of areas like it is for suburbs or or neighborhoods. This applies to all specific objects. Um, maybe there was a bit of misunderstanding that in greening urban mobility, this specifically targets functional urban areas, and there is of course a a big um, urban dimension there, but overall um, peripheral neighborhoods or suburbs, as long as they comply with at least one of the three requirements which have been presented before, they can be addressed in each of the four specific objectives which are open in the call. Thank you. Thank you, Monica, for answering this uh, first uh, question. We will come to the next one. I see Ferenc Albert Sigeti, uh, who is asking about SO 1.2 and uh, whether they can come up with an innovative project idea which is not explicitly um, or included. No, no, ah, there. Uh, included in the relevant national S3 strategies. So, a very specific question already. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as a general answer, SO 1.2 is aimed at strengthening skills for smart specialization, industrial transition and entrepreneurship. So this is a very broad range. And if you will read through our IP, through our docu program document, what is actually important that in SO 1.2, each of the actions is coherent with smart specialization strategies of those regions. Um, which means that uh, we will not fund anything which is not in line or which is not um, in coherence with those smart specialization strategies. Um, the question is actually one which says if it's not explicitly mentioned in the in the in the smart in the relevant S three strategy. I think this is to be seen whether this, um, even if I don't know which topic you want to address in your project, um, at least you should somehow argue that it is coherent, it fits into the smart specialization strategy. 
sometimes I know these S3 strategies, they are more on a, a higher level and don't, do not maybe go down into really specific types of actions which would be done. But what is um, needed in terms of relevance that you explain in the application form, how you consider what you want to do is in coherence with the smart specialization strategy. So we will not fund anything which is against smart, the smart specialization strategy of the region. Thank you, Monica. I think this was very clear now. Um, we have an anonymous uh, question. How will you evaluate and score territorial challenges of peripheral areas in the submitted proposals? What will be the benchmark? Uh, you touched on that a little bit already in your presentation. I think the question is very sim similar to what I said before, um, that it's really on a case-by-case -case basis. We will not do any comparative assessment. There, we will not consider any particular benchmark. It's really that uh, each project has to explain in a qualitative way and in a very convincing way how at least one of, out of the three characteristics which are mandatory are, are met um, by, by the regions to be addressed. And there are various ways to do this, but uh, on purpose, we do not give, as said before, any list of eligible areas or maps or benchmarks. It's really to be seen on a case by cases, what are the particular challenges um, of these regions and how are these characteristics and why you as an applicant consider that those are in line and comply with one of these three requirements, which are mentioned in the TOR. Thank you, Monica. Uh, very much into the same direction is the next question by Holger Zeiser. If the Espon report prophecy um, from 2017 uh, builds a basis or is a good basis to see what regions are lagging or peripheral. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for this question. So actually, um, since mentioning prof the prophecy project by Espen, this was actually a study and a project where also our program took some inspiration for coming up with these three requirements. Um, this um, ESPAN study serves somehow as a, I would say, rather a background than something which is really to be used for developing your application. Of course, you're welcome to read for it and there are various other also documents or bibliography on, on peripheral regions which might give you some inspiration on what are, what are the challenges, what are the problems of um, peripheral and lagging areas. But please um, do not really go into the specificities or details of prophecy, since it also includes uh, a list of regions which is not applicable to us. So as said before, um, in terms of qualifying for um, the territorial focus of the call, please really stick to these three criteria and explain in a convincing way how your project relates or the areas, how they match with at least one of the criteria. Maybe since there were background um, documents mentioned, I would also like to draw your attention to um, the territorial agenda and to the pilot actions. There are two ones which are of particular interest, and I think you find also a link um, to them in the TOR. There is one um, called which is Small Places Matter, and another one which is a future for um, uh, for all places, um, which um, can give you also some inspiration or some ideas um, what could be potential topics or in which way um, also project ideas, ideas could be developed. Thank you, Monica, um, for clarifying this. I, I think it's um, very clear uh, now how to uh, use such documents um, and, and how we um, uh, also apply these. And um, so I think for now, we, this is it on the territorial and thematic focus. We will maybe bring you back, Monica, but we will be moving a little bit deeper now into um, the project work plan already, into the intervention logic, etc. Um, 
So the next question would be for uh, my colleague Christoph, who I would like to ask to come back. Here he is. Hello, Christoph. Hello. Hello. So we have a question on pilot actions. Um, so someone has some concrete plans already. This is Roman Hillebrand. Uh, will a pilot action be carried out jointly by the partners in just one region or should the same pilot action be implemented in parallel in all partner regions, Christoph? Yes, uh, I thank you for this question. It's actually a very important point. And I saw also that there are a couple of questions related to pilot actions. So maybe to to, to put it a, a bit into a larger frame, since the pilot actions are a core feature of your project uh, and of your hopefully successful project. So what first of all, what is important is that the pilot action should have a demonstration and experimentation character. It should test and pioneer novel approaches. Um, for doing that, uh, since we are a transnational cooperation program, it should be jointly developed and jointly implemented. So as we have the definition in the Annex 2 to the program manual, it should involve partners from at least two countries in the development and in the implementation. So um, coming to the question, the, the answer would be yes, you need partners from at least two countries um, when you implement, when you develop and implement the pilot. Mm -hmm. And then the second part, um, no, not in each country, there should be the same pilot because a pilot action per se should be limited in its scope and in its duration, and it should be unprecedented. So you should not do the same thing in all the different countries. Uh, each pilot action should be different in its kind. So in your project, you can have either one pilot action on which you're working transnationally with several partners from several countries, or you have several pilot actions, which each have its own, their own spin, but they need to be different from each other. Um, Frank, if you allow me, I can already touch on the second question, which is still linked to the pilot actions. Well, how to understand this element of soft in, in the pilot actions? Um, I think this is also a very good question uh, and a very good point to make here. Soft is in the meaning we, the pilot action cannot include any physical investments. So you cannot include infrastructure and works because simply the duration and the budget, which we are foreseeing, for small scale projects would not allow you to go into infrastructure and works. So the meaning of soft is no digging, no building, uh, no infrastructure and works. Yet you can, and you should even, uh, have a clear demonstration experimentation character. You should experiment new services. You should experiment new approaches, new tools, new procedures. So in this question, there was reference to transport services. Yes, sure. Transport services is a new service provided. Uh, I presume that the, uh, the applicant is uh, coming from the transport field. So yes, if it fits into your project, please do so. So um, what is important, the word soft is not to be misunderstood in the sense that we just want meetings. No, we want concrete implementation, testing on the ground. Uh, we want tangible and uh, place-based um, approaches uh, which lead to clear results. So, yes, this is a bit the uh, larger picture of the pilot actions. Super, Christoph. Thank you very much for combining two questions to be ticked off already. So, um, we are on good track to manage all the questions in the remaining time, I think. We have another one for you from Lisa Petitjean. Any minimum requirements for the lead partner in terms of size, previous experience, uh, strict stipulations and the annexes to the application form? Um, so who can become a lead partner? Well, a lead partner can become an institution which is located in the Central Europe area or which is considered as an assimilated partner. Uh, then there are specific requirements for the lead partner when it comes to a financial capacity of the organization. But then I saw a related question also to um, the partnership composition as such, uh, whether there are bonus points uh, with regards to number of partners, number of institutions uh, to be involved. And there the answer is um, no, it, it doesn't make your proposal better if you cover all the Central Europe countries or if you have very large partnerships. So what is important is that you have the relevant partners with the right competences on board. This applies to your lead partner. So your lead partner should show the competence to implement and manage successfully a transnational cooperation project. 
uh, fulfilling the minimum requirements, uh, which are defined also in the uh, terms of reference. And at the same time, your partnership should have the right partners on board, which bring together the competences and the expertise for the project. Thank you, Christoph. This reminds me a little bit of uh, now, now, now I will uh, give the audience some insights into our office in the past years. We used to have a colleague with a band that was called The More the Merrier. This is not true for the project partnerships. Um, I think that was a very clear uh, answer. And similar to that is also, and again, a number on quantification is um, how many projects can be submitted by a partner or a lead partner, Christoph? So again, the more the better or? Well, I think everyone should just submit the proposal of which he or she is convinced of, where you have the partners who are really eager to have, make the change, who are committed to make the change. So I think it makes not, no, no sense of submitting 10 proposals or five proposals. Uh, please rather work on your proposal and to have a very good and convincing proposal. As said, it is also mandatory to have a consultation on each project idea for which you want to submit a proposal. So this is all also a very important aspect that you need to have this mandatory consultation. Please keep this in mind. Um, yeah, so with your proposal, it's, it's, I would say, no, it's not, definitely not the more the merrier. Please come with a good and mature project proposals so that uh, you have good chances of being funded. Thank you, Christoph. Um, another question related to also to um, the lead partners. Um, so who should actually apply for a consultation? Who should request the consultation? Uh, does it have to be the future lead partner or could it uh, be any partner? Well, in our program, we have the lead partner principle. So the, the proposal in the end is submitted in GEMS uh, by the lead partner and who is uh, standing behind the project. So I think it makes sense uh, that we also talk to the lead partner who wants to build its partnership and uh, to uh, who wants to bring the partners together uh, around the project. Nevertheless, we know that in practice, there are sometimes the cases uh, where there is already a partnership which is um, set up. And in the last moment, there might be a change of who is taking uh, the responsibility of a lead partner. So that's why it is very important uh, that each project idea needs to be consulted. Uh, and there is not a reference to a specific partner, uh, which we included in the requirements. Thank you, Christoph. Um, the next one, how can we request a uh, consultation through the help desk or somewhere else? Um, this, I think I can answer quickly in between to give you a short break because we have more coming for you. Um, so you have to request the uh, consultation where you are now. So um, as soon as the um, period for requesting consultations opens, uh, which is very, very soon on the 17th, um, there will be a new uh, header um, in the menu header, a new um, menu item, the individual consultations, and you request your consultation through this community where you are right now following this webinar. So everything is in this place um, and you requested there. There was another question linked to uh, this, Christoph, a little bit um, like what is exactly an outline of uh, a consultation? How does it work on project development? <clears throat> We have on our website a description, a specific uh, subsite on the consultations. But Christoph, maybe you can inspire uh, briefly. Like, what is the usual uh, process there? Yeah, it's um, actually. I'm. It really depends where you stand. We sometimes have consultations uh, with people who have never been in any interact project and. Uh, uh, they they have an idea and they want to see how can we can we work uh, uh, in the transnational cooperation program like Interreg Central Europe uh, with such an idea. I think in this regard, uh, my advice would be uh, please talk also to our national contact points in all the countries. They can give you a lot of information. Um, so usually the idea which lands then uh, for the consultation uh, in the community. Uh, and which is consulted by the JS is already uh, 
more advanced. It should be uh, uh, already more or less clear um, what you want to do, which types of partners you want to involve. But then it's really up to you uh, what you want to discuss with us. Um, if you want to discuss the idea as such, so the, 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 the thematic scope, the partnership, or in case you want to discuss more technical aspects uh, uh, from uh, your application. So what is important with regards to these consultations is that we are offering only one consultation per project idea. So you have only one chance for this consultation. So don't come too early, don't come too late, but it's up to you to see when, when is the perfect timing for your consultation. Um, you have seen, uh, or you will see as soon as you look into the terms of reference, that there is a time frame in which you can uh, request uh, the uh, consultations in the community, uh, which is stretching from the 17th of October till the 3rd of December. Uh, we would advise you not to come too late uh, so that you can then also really well integrate the learnings and the feedback you received in the consultation when you are preparing your application to be submitted to us. Super. Thank you very much, Christoph. Um, I think we can give you a break now and uh, go back into some uh, thematic issues now also. Um, and for this, I call back my colleague Monica. We have 10 minutes left, roughly. Um, um, we have quite a few questions left. Hello, Monica. So uh, let's see what we manage in the remaining 10 minutes. Uh, as I said, we can also go on a little longer. There's a recording if you have to leave early and on time. Um, but we will try to answer most, uh, if not all, of the questions that are there. Monica, we have a question on 3.1 and 2.5. What is the difference there, really? Um, so when you if you want to work on sustainable transport, is this not a rather a 2.5? Uh, shall this uh, applicant, Mr. Bugatti, uh, rather go into 3.1? Um, what is your recommendation here? Um, yeah. I think that's that's a very good question, and um, because we also received quite some 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 questions on this topic before, how to distinguish between what should be under two point five and what to be under three point one. Um, I think the main feature is in two point five is the functional urban area approach, and this is something which I mentioned before. This is crucial. So a project to be submitted under 2.5 has to clearly consider both um, the city or a town and its hinterland. So these linkages between peri-urban areas, hinterlands and the town as such. And in 2.5, in this call, um, it could be, for instance, smaller towns, which are considered as lagging or peripheral um, to be addressed by project but then also considering all these functional linkages with um, the areas around. So this is a main feature of um, SO 2.5. Um, on the other hand, in 3.1, this um, SO deals with improving transport connections of peripheral areas, linking them to transport nodes. So this is might be, I don't know, as, as an example that how to improve maybe the mobility or even even logistics from um, from a village to uh, um, to a major transport network to a transport node in order to improve accessibility. So there might be of course some 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 issues which are common to both SOs, but that's the main two um, distinctions. And maybe also to say that in both SOs, you could address actually passenger transport and also freight transport or logistics. So these um, both um, types of um, transport um, topics are, are, are possible in both SOs. And um, I think there was also the question about what means sustainable. So, in our program, we are overall devoted to the environmental sustainability by design principle. This means we will not fund any projects which are in, not in line with environmental sustainability 
or which would increase even transport emissions would or would um, cause any negative environmental effects. So this is why also in terms of sustainability um, projects, for an example, could also address um, reduction of, 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 of transport emissions or introducing some more environmentally um, types of, of public transport. I hope this clarifies the question. I think so, Monica. Thank you very much. Uh, we have another one on um, SO4.1. Um, if um, this one is addressed and considers the digital transition and skills theme. Um, should the applicant also indicate SO 1.2 and create a separate work package? So I think I understand this question um, if, if they can tackle two specific objectives at the same time, Monica. Um, I think for that, uh, clear, I would say it's over formally, it's a no. Because each project has to clearly focus on one of the specific objectives. So you have really to select the project object, um, the, the program specific objective you would like to address by your project proposal. Um, considering what is the main emphasis of or the main focus of your project idea. Of course, you have can have linkages to other SOs. That's very valid. For instance, as you're saying, that you might, uh, I don't know, if you submit, for instance, in SO 4.1 dealing with governance, there could be, of course, a component dealing with skills development, which might, however, not be the main focus. If you say your project is focusing on integrated um, approaches for better governance, that would be the main um, focus main emphasis and therefore you would need to select also SO 4.1 under which the project is submitted. You can address other topics, of course, be it, I don't know, mobility, be it skills development. This is very legitimate. Um, but you have to clearly choose what is the SO under which you have to want to submit. Thank you, Monica. Um, the next one, uh, we are leaving now the thematic focus. We are going back into the territorial focus. Um, low economic potential and relational proximity, etc., cetera, um, are not exact categories is, um, is um, what is written here. What specific parameters do areas have to meet in order to qualify as lagging? Now, I think... Um as I said before, there are no other specific parameters. On purpose, um, at program level, these um, three characteristics were defined in a way that um, they allow really a, a qualitative um, justification. So without going into in any eligibility or benchmarking with other areas. So it's, it's really up to each of the projects on a case by case is also considering the scope of the project to explain in which way or why um, this area is characterized, by instance, by low, low, um, low economic potential, why, is, why it has particular challenges in terms of socioeconomic development or relational proximity to, to the areas which are um, around. So yeah, there is no more specific answer to this question. It's really up to each project to argue in a convincing way how to um, comply with at least one of these three requirements. It's an opportunity, Monica. This is how I would see it. Um, so now that we have opened the call and the application package is out, um, I kind of would have expected more questions on budget already, but okay, we uploaded the application package only this morning. The details are out only for a short time. So I see we have two questions for you, Helga. 
And um, before we officially uh, run out of time, uh, we will extend by a few minutes, as I said, but before we officially run out of time, let's touch on these two questions uh, related to budget. One is from Elena Grandi. If option three is implemented, the 40% uh, at the cost categories will be reimbursed for the full amount uh, as submitted, or will they have to provide supporting documents for the costs incurred? So when submitting such costs to the uh, national controller, it would be documentation related to the staff costs that have to be provided and not uh, for the 40%. So it's always what is checked is the basis of uh, the flat rate. So what in this case, it would be staff costs. So for the other costs, uh, nothing has to be proved and documented. Thank you, Helga. And Francesca Oldani is asking, uh, has a question about preparation costs and if these would be paid out only for proposals that are being funded. I let you bring over the uh, bad news, Helga. Yes, unfortunately, I'm not, I won't bring good news here. It is only projects that will be uh, approved and funded that will uh, receive the lump sum if they would have foreseen it in the application form. Okay, Helga, thank you very much. Uh, this was it already for budget, it seems. So thank you for now. Maybe this is a good time to make some advertisement for what is coming next. On the uh, 25th of October, so in 10 days from now, we have a very special format for you, uh, in which, which we call Q&A webinar. Um, this webinar will be just the other way around from today's webinar. So... Um, what we will do there is we will have no presentation. We will be there, the same speakers as today. Um, however, we will only take your questions. Um, I'm pretty sure in 10 days from now, when you uh, start working on your uh, applications, you will have more budget-related questions also for Helga, but also more specific questions already on the thematic focus, maybe on the work plan, on your intervention logic. Um, this Q&A webinar, the idea of this is uh, to be, to offer something in between today's webinar and the individual consultations. So your questions can be and should be more specific already. We will try to cover them all. We will not give individual uh, feedback on proposals, of course, in this Q&A webinar, but it's your chance to clarify whatever you didn't understand or what, what was not clear in your view um, in the TOR, in the program manual, uh, in the application form or other uh, documents that we provided. And with that, um, I have officially time is over, but we will continue, let's say, at least uh, for another 10 minutes, maybe. Um, so we have a question from Clemens Kaufmann. Uh, should all citizens groups be targeted equally or can the focus be on one special group, for example, the elderly? And for that question, I think, Monica, this uh, to me uh, sounds like thematic uh, focus also, um, I think, yeah, it could, could also be work plan related. I know we, we could have also asked Christoph to answer this, of course, but Monica, um, floor is yours. Thank you very much. Yeah, I think it's very good to set the focus on a particular target group. But of course, this it depends on what is the what is the focus or what is the scope of your project. If you're dealing with, I don't know, public transport, for instance, for disadvantaged people or elderly, of course, it's good to set a particular focus on, on a specific target group. Um, I think, yeah, it has to be always in line with the intervention logic, with your project objectives, and then you should choose the right target groups. And yeah, there is no need to involve all, and it, I think it also comes back not more the merrier. So I think the same rule applies also here, that it's good that you set a specific focus um, depending on what is the scope of your, of your project idea. Thank you, Monica. Uh, stay with me. We have two more questions coming for you at, the, at least. So uh, we have an anonymous one. We are an organization in a rural lagging area that is part of a 
uh, developed Croatian county, a bigger area. And as such, uh, this uh, area is not recognized by the development trap index. Uh, could they still apply? Could they still be a targeted area? Um, this I think question. this comes very back, very the same, back to the very same explanation which I gave before. In our definition of um, lagging or our requirements of peripheral and lagging areas, we are not applying any index or any specific indicators. So uh, it's really up to you if you can explain in a convincing way that this specific area is characterized by at least one of the three requirements which are defined in the call. This is, is absolutely fine. There is no need to, to refer to a particular index. Thank, thank you, Monica. Um, we just went through the questions. We believe we answered most of them in one way or the other already. So we have one final question um, that is related to partnership. But rather than calling Christoph back in for a single question, Monica, I would just extend this to you. Uh, the, the question is, can the project include partners from developed regions, areas as well, um, to be able to bring in the knowledge or best practices into a project? Yeah, yeah. I think that's a very good question. And it was maybe partly already addressed also in, in Christoph's presentation. So overall partners from all areas or all regions can participate. And what is important when um, developing your partnership that you have the partners on board which implement the, um, or which have also the competences to implement the activities in the peripheral and lagging areas. But of course, if it makes sense and if there is the need for support from partners located in other types of regions, be it either um, research organizations or also could be also, I don't know, a municipality which is very much advanced in a particular topic and which wants to bring in its particular expertise and best practice, this is more than welcome. What is important that you have the partners on board which are competent for acting in, in your regions. And then, of course, it's up to you how you complement the partnership with other partners, bringing support or additional expertise in the partnership. Super. Thank you very much, Monica. I think with this, um, we have extended five minutes. Um, we should slowly come to an end. Um, there's a few more open questions I can see, but um, reading through these questions, a lot of that will become very, very clear immediately when you start reading through the TOR, uh, through the program manual. So um, I, I um, heartily uh, recommend to... Uh, download the application package to look into the documents that we are providing there. And um, if you still have any further questions related to the to the questions you have been asking today, come back in 10 days, as I said, to the Q&A webinar and, um, and bring in these questions and we will answer them there in this very um, dedicated meeting on your questions and answers. So before we close, I would also like to remind you not only about this uh, webinar that we will uh, be running on the 25th of October in the morning again. Um, I would also really uh, like to invite you to make sure um, that you use the support of our contact points. Helga presented uh, the dates of the Q&A sessions they are hosting, the National Info Days they are organizing either online or uh, in person uh, in your countries. You can ask um, all your questions there, even in national languages. This is a great advantage of the national support um, that is offered by our contact points. So if there are any issues, also national uh, rules, um, this is the place to be, the place to go. But also apart from these events, the contact points are always available there and ready to help and support you. And... Last but not least, um, uh, this was also mentioned quite a few times already today. Um, if your proposal, and we saw that some of you already are quite advanced, if your proposal is in a shape to request an individual consultation already as of the day after tomorrow, go ahead, request the consultation, request your slot, um, 
time is tight. We heard the call is open not even for two months. Um, so uh, do this consultation as soon as your proposal is in a good shape uh, to be consulted upon. Um, if for, for most of you, though, uh, that are with us today, I think it might be a good idea to also wait for the 25th of October, ask your more general questions, and then request a slot soon after. But don't wait for too long. Um, sometime in November uh, and early December, the consultations have to happen uh, the latest. And as you heard before, these are compulsory. So um, don't wait for too long. Um, with this, I would be very interested, um, and here I would like to bring uh, in a very last uh, Slido um, poll, because in the in the morning when we started, I asked um, in what shape your efforts are to apply with us, or if you're interested in applying with uh, in applying with us. And fifty percent were not sure yet. So those that are still with us, I invite you to uh, let us know in a poll that you will see in the community now. Um, whether you are now more motivated or whether this uh, brief uh, in, in these brief insights into the rules and requirements and the focus of the call um, are rather um, say like telling you no this call is not uh, for us and we will wait for another call for the next call um, but we will not hand in an application. So we have 81 uh, feedbacks already. Let me see um, where we are with the results there. So with 80 results, the, the current count is that nearly half of you found find the call interesting, but are not sure yet where to apply um and what uh, like in which in which specific objective only five percent of you are not interested in this call this is great news i really like that um so i think we we have developed a call and and um we are opening this call that seems to be fitting also to your needs out there um in terms of thematic uh focus we see that most of you are planning to submit an application in SO 1.2. That's 22% um, I see, then followed by governance and uh, then green urban mobility and transport. So if we also can convince the 46% that are still undecided, I think uh, this will be very interesting. I'm looking forward to receiving uh, interesting applications and um, yeah, thank you for participating in this poll. And with this, I would like to close for today and uh, thank all our speakers. Maybe I can bring you all back. So maybe you can switch on your cameras briefly. So thank you, Helga, Christoph, Monica, and also Luca, who's there he is. Um, thank you for providing all your valuable insights today. Thank you also to the technical team in the background uh, that was working behind the scenes to ensure that everything runs smoothly. And yeah, we hope we met your expectations uh, today with this um, core launch webinar and look forward to having your detailed feedback tomorrow when we send the email, including the presentations you saw today and including also a link to the recording of this webinar. So thank you very much again for your participation and questions. Have a nice and productive autumn and see you most likely in 10 days again. Bye-bye. Thank you.